everyone, it's Cindy and welcome back to Studio Lou. So I'm here today to just do kind of a casual project with you to show you how to use super beautiful black and white book pages like these ones. Um, just a couple of different techniques. So what I first want to do is I'm going to take this file folder so that I can use it to back the images onto because I need them to both have a bit of a firm backing. Um, these are like Pendaflex kind of files and I always just tear off this um, metal bit here. You can keep these too to um, you know embellish with. I usually just kind of run a finger down in the crease and I will get rid of the metal because um, it's just sharp and I don't have a lot of projects that I do with those. <laughs> so we'll get rid of both of these. But they are really great for collage. Just be careful not to, you know, cut your finger as you're sliding it down there. You could use a bone folder instead. Okay, let's get rid of that. Now, just tear this in half. And I'll set one aside. I'll set these these two pieces aside because that's project two. So this is project one. And what I'd like to do with this is first kind of choose what size I want this piece of ephemera to be. Now, this could be a page in a journal, or you could make like a smaller piece of ephemera with it. I think I actually might target it to be a page in a journal. And I can eyeball the size that, that I want that to be. So um, what I will do here is just go ahead and on the green side, I'm going to just glue on with glue stick um, onto this paper. I just have to grab my glue stick. I was cleaning up my desk this morning and I completely buried my glue stick, I think. And hopefully this one is not empty. No, I don't. Oh, maybe I might need to grab a new one. Just one moment. All right. Now we will glue it on with this new glue stick. Honestly, the back side of it's so pretty. I think I would end up using it in a journal as well. But for the purposes of today's project, I just want to glue this on here, which I've done. And then we'll cut it on out. Actually, you know what? I just remembered. I want to lift that back up again. I don't want the, there's like an end kind of piece on these folders that has a line and I just want to avoid that if I can. There we go. The good thing about my glue is that it, it um, gives you a little bit of time. You can lift it right on up. But maybe what I'll do is actually just leave this down on here. I won't even cut it out. Okay. So let me just bring this up closer to the camera so you can look at it. So we have a bunch of irises here. We have this pretty tree that looks kind of like a linden tree maybe. We've got some ivies in the back and we've got some um, little plants up here. So I think, you know, my favorite ivies um, or sorry, my favorite irises are the sort of light purple ones um, and also the dark purple and yellow ones. So let's just go ahead. What I want to do with this is watercolor to colorize this picture. Just got to watch my drips here because my this bottle's gotten a little drippy. So I'm just getting my my beam paints wet here. Um, for those of you not familiar, I use typically beam paints for most of my projects in watercolor because they are an indigenous Canadian brand and they are all of the good things, good for the planet, um, like healthy, safe for children, low, low waste kind of things. They're in these little wraps made of beeswax. They come wrapped in beeswax. They're really, really nice. So just grab my brush here. I've got a little bit of water in this little old dish. Um, so now I think what I'll do is I'll just start filling in from the back to the front. So first I'm going to think about the color that these ivies would be. Now I don't have um, a swatch 
chart for this yet. I keep meaning to make one and I'll probably do that soon because I am um, going to be doing a project with these paints. But I can tell that this is a nice kind of deeper green. So I'm going to just mix it a little over here and see. Yeah, I like that green. Um, so I'm going to use that back here in this panel. Now, the thing about watercolor that's great is that it's, you know, transparent. And you can just kind of play with it with the amount of pigment that you want very easily. You're not going to get, you know, super overwhelmed. Just make sure that, you know, you're, you're using it like a watercolor and that if you have, you know, some gouache, because I have some gouache in my watercolors, um, that, you know, you're careful about how much paint you get on your brush. The nice thing though is you can come back if you've gotten a little too opaque and you can add more water, you can um, blot with some, you know, towel or cloth. So don't be stressed about the kinds of lines that you're getting at this stage or if you feel like you're overriding uh, the images, it doesn't matter because you're going background to foreground. And you'll want to use a higher quality paint um, because you do want to get good pigmentation. Okay, so then what I think I will do is think about, um, so I have this sculpture of this girl here and I have to think about what color I want her to be. And I feel like I want her to kind of be bronzy. Um, so I have a bronze paint here. And it is metallic, so I've got to be a bit careful or else I will lose the lines of the the metallic um, or the uh, the image under that metallic paint because metallic paint, it has um, pigmentation that kind of stands up on top of details and the shimmer makes it shine a little more. So. That's all the paint that I'm going to use. And what I see right now is just kind of like a bit of a blob. So I'm just going to come in and kind of blot. And now I can see that image again. Now the trouble with, hopefully you can see this better than the glare that I'm getting, but I, I can see um, the image. Hopefully you can too. Let me check the camera and see if you see. just brought you in a little bit closer and I think you can see the details which is good. Um, so then I'm going to go with the color that I want in the linden tree up above and that's more of a brighter green. Um, so I'm going to just come in and just fill this tree in. Come into the little spaces here that I had not filled in before. And for this kind of work, you are going to need either a nice range of like green tones or, you know, whatever you're painting, you need a few tones, um, especially if you're doing like landscape. Um, but if you don't have them, of course, you can mix your watercolor paints <clears throat> to create some new tones. Because what we're doing is like watercolor colorizing, um, you know, it's not exactly a painting, right? So don't don't worry too much about the things that you would worry if you were doing a painting, like details. <clears throat> this is just colorizing; it's not doing a detailed painting. And I'm using this bit of water to just kind of shift some of this green around that I did in the darker range. You're seeing over here how it's looking when it's drier. So now I want to get a bit of a blue for the back of the sky. When I was starting this, I didn't think about the sky. I said we would go background to foreground. The sky is actually the back background, right? But there's not too much of it there, so it doesn't really matter a whole lot. But we'll just fill it in now. All right, so now I've got this bit of grass here and back here. I want to do that in a slightly different green. So I think I'll use this one. It'll just be kind of a little chalkier. I'm just going to fill 
the nondescript parts of this that I think look kind of like this nondescript grass. I'm just going to fill it in in the same way <clears throat> with this color. Probably just come in through the middle of the irises here too because it's all just kind of nondescript greens in between the flowers. Okay, so then we have three more different kinds of greenery. So down here I'm going to make, this looks like a creeping jenny kind of plant to me and there are very bright green so I think I'll use the same as I used in the linden tree um, and then I've got a little bit of like leftover mixed green here which has created a new tone so I'm going to use that for this here I think I might add a little more of the dark to it though just to get a little more pigment because it's mostly just my rinse water that was there but I do want to have some pigmentation on this. You don't want every piece of a composition like this to steal the show. You've got to sort of choose what you want to pop, right? So I'm choosing in this case, it will be the irises for sure, but also this Creeping Jenny up front or what I'm calling Creeping Jenny. I really want that to pop. Okay, now if you think about the leaf color of irises, it's actually quite dark. I'm wondering if I could get away with using, yeah, I probably could. This is a little bluer than what they would be maybe, but that's okay. And when I paint with this, I'm just going to follow kind of the shape of you know, they're, they're like sword blades, um, iris leaves. So I'm just going to follow that kind of shaping as I'm moving the paintbrush. So just start with like a small tip and then get wider. It's almost like painting along the green with something, you know. There you go. And what you'll notice is with like images like this, you know, they're photograph based, <clears throat> but like they're going to give you different tones and it will kind of work with you in a way. So now I finished all the greenery, but I want to add some pops of green um, or blue or something. I'm, I'm looking for what color I might want to use. So I've got this color here. It's a little bit metallic and I just want to add a couple special highlights like there's these tall little plants right here and I'm going to just follow them and even kind of create a few more just with this special pretty paint and then I might just come down a little on that boring tone that I had up here that kind of pastel -y tone and just use the washout of the brush on this section to give it a little more color. And then I'll go back into the paint I used on the Creeping Jenny and I'll give that another coat because I don't want my changes up above to impact that this is supposed to be very bright. And then I'll come up to the tree again and take a look at it and see where it could use more color. A second coat. These are highly pigmented paints, but the way that I'm using them with extra water, it's, um, you know, kind of toning down their natural pigmentation. So it gives me stages that I can come back and add more if I want to, right? But not make the whole decision at once and then be stuck with this too, um, too pigmented shade. Okay, so now we'll come in and do the last part of this and get out of the range of those um, greens. And I want to go right into this purple here. It's this nice deep purple. And see how it goes here. So I'm just going to think about what the, um, the 
shape of an iris is. We'll start with a wide brush maybe and do like just kind of, I don't know, let, let the paint kind of follow your brush and just paint in the shape of an iris. Follow the picture, the shape that you see, and just fill in those spaces. You don't have to draw an iris. So I'm only going to focus on just the purple first. So if you're thinking about, you know, I'd like to do flowers that have more than one color in them, that's okay. This is the base layer, so you just do the base layer first. The nice thing is, is you have this picture as a guide. You don't have to be somebody artistically inclined to be able to paint an actual iris. They're a very hard flower to paint, actually, because they're very shapely. And they have an unnatural kind of um, flower pattern to them. The shape of their, their bloom is weird. So what I know about irises, typically when I see them, is that they do have a little shock of yellow, but they also can have like a nice lighter purple tone to them. So I'm going to go into this. This is like a little more of a gouache paint, this lighter purple. So I'm going to bring some over to the side here and just go in on the spaces where it seems like it's a little drier and I could kind of impact the, the tones that are there just adding little highlights and then I think I'll do the same actually with a yellow and I'm going to kind of wait for it to dry a little bit just blow on it a titch and then go in with a really tiny little brush stroke. You could even use a smaller brush for this, but I won't. So I'm just kind of daubing each one of them because we're looking for where the yellows would be in the flowers, right? You can kind of do a couple. Don't do one on every one or you'll look like you have dots. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit abstract, but not that abstract. So we'll let this dry a bit and then we'll come back to it and I'll prep the other project for you. But hopefully you can get an idea of what I was going for here. So I'll set this aside to dry. I'll move all the paint out of the way and we'll set up the next project. Okay, so now we're on to project two and I'm going to do the same thing here. Just quickly glue this image down. Um, I don't think I'm going to be using the whole image in this one, so I will trim this one down. And for a couple of reasons, I need it to have an easy handle on it where I can hold it up and, and work with it in my hands. So this is going to actually be, um, an embroidery type project. So I want to focus only on probably right here. And when I say embroidery, think of French knots and balloons because that's what I'm going to be doing. So now I'll just cut out the rest of this because the edge being torn up looking or not doesn't really matter at the moment. this down. This is any glue blobs. I don't want glue blobs. Feels pretty good. All right, so now I'm going to grab my, this is my little gardener's nailer. Um, you can get them at the dollar store. I use them for when I am stabbing things like signatures. I'm putting the holes in. So what I want to do is I've grabbed a selection of greens, pinks, and a brown, and I want to 
put some color in this garden. So you see all these images, this, these little roses. This is clearly a house that's covered in some kind of a flowering plant. Um, and then there's some, you know, bushery down here. And then there's this evergreen of sorts up here. So what I would like to do is just create some holes in clusters in a few different places where I think I might want to add details. Now I'm adding the holes to just make it easier. You don't have to. You could stitch um, through your paper with a sharp needle, but I like to do embroidery with an embroidery needle, which means it's not sharp. It's the kind of thing that you, you use for cross stitch. So I'm going to come up here and I like to do kind of a almost a zigzag pattern. And then I will add a few holes in another little cluster down here. I like uneven numbers and I like to go around windows and doors where typically there's more floral, pretty kind of bits. And then um, we're going to be working in French knots and bullions. So I'm going to go up to the tippy top here of this tree and just try to distribute down this one a little randomly, but all over this whole evergreen. And this is a little more obviously work, right? It's more intensive than maybe what you feel like doing. It's not that bad though, to be honest. So now think of this as a piece of ephemera. How would you want to work with it to make it feel even, evenly distributed, right? So I feel like I've got holes, you know, up here. I want the bottom to just kind of stay paper. I'm not going to touch this castle. I've got clusters around the windows, down this trellisy type side, around the door, both sides of the door, and then all the way up and down this evergreen. And I just used my paper piercer to do that. Now my little, um, this is my little handmade um, pin cushion that I keep here on my desk. So this is an example here of an embroidery needle. So see how very dull the edge is. They typically have a gold top and they have a nice big hole because you can use embroidery floss with them. Um, embroidery floss is six strands typically and you can choose to use any number of those strands to get different um, you know, sort of the size of your stitches, like how big and pronounced will your stitches be. So I'm going to go with all six on mine. And what I'll do is just thread my needle and I will come in from the back here at the top through one of these. And then I'm not going to tie a knot in the end. Instead, what I'm going to do, because I don't want to have a big bumpy knot on the back, I'm just going to take a little bit of masking tape. And I'm going to seal this down. You can make it shorter if you want to, but it truly doesn't matter. <clears throat> now, when we talk about a French knot, the way that you do a French knot is that you would wrap one, two, three times around your needle um, and then you're going to come back through the same hole or a similar hole and then you're going to get this little see that little knot that little french knot <clears throat> now one thing about this is the holes that i put in there are actually quite big with the paper piercer and this is not fabric so see what's happened it's come right back through so the, uh, the, the reason it's important that this is not fabric is with fabric, you have the option to kind of go into the hole right next door, right? But in this case, I don't um, because I have, you know, paper. I'm not going to punch a whole ton of holes. So that's going to mean I want to do booleans, which is wrapping probably, you know, anywhere from five to ten times in different sizes around my needle. Um, or in, in different wrap, amounts of wraps to make different sizes of clustered knots or bullions. So see that? That's going to have texture and that's not going to go through. 
So then what you need to do is you look at all these holes and you think, which of these do I want to be green? And which do I want to be shades of pink? And do I want this to be the same green? Three, four, five, six on this one. Try to not wrap too tightly so you can bring it nice and close to the hole. And, it, and don't go too tight because then you can't slide your needle back if you want to. Um, another way you can trap the thread is actually by stitching right through the plies. Like you go right, as you're coming through, go right through the plies of the thread. The very opposite of what you want to do when we're doing signatures, right? So now I've got two of that green there. I'm going to add one here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So again, I'm going to vary the number of wraps to get different sizes of bullion. Slide this needle back a bit. Back through the same hole. Okay, and that's all I'm going to put there. I'm not going to do any more of that green. And I'll go over to the next section. Now don't worry about the string on the back, that's fine. We're going to back this whole journal card. Go six on this wrap. Oops. We will re-thread my needle. So then what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to distribute in this green all throughout this project. Um, and so let me do that and come right back. All right, so I have finished up adding a few of these on this side, but now I'm kind of at the place with my thread where I don't really want to go a whole lot further. So I'm going to just clip it a little bit. Um, you can, if you want to, before I clipped it, I could have, you know, kept it on the needle and you can tie a knot. I don't recommend doing a bunch of knots though, because you'll build up bulk on the back of your card that way. And you don't want a whole bunch of big giant knots, right? Um, so that's fine. And it doesn't matter if the plies, you know, get a little separated, not a big deal. So then again, I'll come back with just a little piece of masking tape. And in the spot where there aren't any holes, I'll just plop that here. Okay, so now see we've got those. So now I'm going to go to another green because I want to use three or four greens on this. And I'm going to use this nice kind of turquoisey green next because it's one of my personal favorites. Um, and I love how it looks with the color of like reds and pinks. Um, so again, we start the same way. You know, I'm going to go up back up to the top here. I'm going to pull this. This one I'm going to trim a little just because it's a little natty at the end. And again, I come in with my little bit of masking tape. And this time I'll go over both of these. Let's tear that excess off. Okay. So then again, one, two, three, four, five. Let's do five on this one. Come back through the same hole. There we go. A little tug. And then I'll probably also use this hole. These may not be all the holes that I add. I'll probably come back in. It's going to be more about how I feel like this looks when I get all of these holes filled up. If I still feel like, oh, well, I don't have enough holes now to add my roses, then I'm going to add more. Uh, because what you'll find is that like the structure of your card, it's totally fine. You backed it with some folder, right? So we're good. Obviously don't do this on just, you know, paper. You could also, I should mention, back this with fabric if you want to. That would also give it a really excellent um, strength and you could use a fabric that you don't care about because it's like ugly or something. It's a good way to use fabric like that because you won't even see the fabric. So I'll keep puttering along in this color and then I'll come back to you when I do another color change. All right, so I finished with the second color and what I was going to show you is 
what I was talking about, about tying a knot. So you can actually go right through the plies of a couple different, you know, others that are hanging out here. So I stitched through all those, right? And then you're going to create this loop. Um, <clears throat> and then you can just pull right through the loop and create a nice little tight knot there. And then go right through your knot again. And then not only have you tied a nice secure knot, you also have kind of gathered these and tightened them a little bit more. So there we go, we have two colors here. And another thing I should mention is if you do this kind of ephemera inside a journal and you're worrying about bulk, don't. What's gonna happen with these bullions is as they get smooshed into the journal, they're gonna get pressed down, they're gonna get pushed down, they're gonna flatten out a little, which will make their surface get a little bit bigger they'll bloom a little bit but it will also like reduce bulk in your journal so i've decided what i want to do <clears throat> next is um the colors that i want to use over here are going to be that light green these two greens um and some maybe little pops of this bright green but in the evergreen i only want to use these two greens and then over here, I'm going to use these two pinks to create some roses. And I'm going to use the brown to just do little bits here and there. So let me get into the next color, which is going to be this nice light kind of yellowy green. This is a really nice color. This is DMC um, 907. And yeah, it's got a really bright feel to it. It's like a, a nice, um, like kelly green spring green kind of um so that will be the next color i will do and then i'll come back okay progress update i've got all of those bright greens in and now i'm going to switch to this green and fill in more of the tree as i've been filling this in i have decided in fact that i'm going to use up all of the holes that i poked for the greenery and then i'll poke new holes for the pinks and um, the brown so yeah, I think this is going to be a little bit more stitched than, you know, I initially thought it was going to be, but I'm actually quite enjoying it. And I think that once you kind of get the hang of doing French knots, um, I used to not like doing them, but now I love doing them and bullions. You just kind of get the, the hang of it. And for these, they don't have to be as like neat and tidy as they are on embroidery. And <clears throat> let me show you. So I've wrapped this five times. You see this little bit of thread here? If I purposely don't tighten it up and I leave it loose, what I'll get is a little bit of a looser um, loop. So over time, you know, you'll see like it's not as tiny and round. Um, here's a good example of one that I left a little longer too. I kind of like how that looks in this application. It doesn't have to be as rigid as when I'm doing embroidery work. Um, Another thing about this, if you're looking at this and going, oh, it's too bulky, you could use a much smaller needle and smaller holes and um, only use like two plies or three plies of the embroidery floss and you'll have a much tinier kind of piece. Um, so like you can literally scale everything down, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of fun. And I've decided most typically right now I'm going about roughly the same size on most of these. I've been doing five-ish wraps. Sometimes I'll go up to eight. Um, but yeah, I think I'm kind of getting comfortable with like five or six wraps. And I'm doing a little variation, but not all that much. So let me finish this dark color and I will come back. All right, so I have all the colors in, all of the pink and green, that is. And I really like how this looks now, it's so cute. So I think what I'd like to do, I have one hole that I left, and I just wanted to kind of test to see what it might be like. Do I want to do little brown French knots, or do I want to do like little, little bitty strings, like little branches maybe? That's a tough decision. I could also stitch um, like little branches into this if I wanted to, like from here to here in the existing holes. That might be kind of cool. It would also be easier. So let's, let's experiment with that. It just adds like a little, you know, more kind of shrubberiness to things. And you can see all the stitching on the back. Um, 
So yeah, I think I will go in existing holes if I can. And just do like a few little brown branches. Just kind of connecting these. Oopsies. I hate when I do that. <laughs> I have my threads too short through my needle. Try to keep a bit of distance between the end of your thread. Okay, in here. Over to here. And I don't need a ton of this, just a little bit, just to kind of maybe connect it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, I'm probably just going to do about like two of them maybe in each cluster to just make it look a little interesting. There we go. Okay, so I'll finish this up and then I'll come back and show you the final product. Okay, so now we have both pieces here side by side. So this one, I, I'm done with it. I finished the brown and I'm happy with it. Um, now you could even combine these techniques. Like I could take some blue watercolor and I can color in the sky here, but I think for now I'm not going to do that. So let's just cut this out because it's nice and dry now. So it took me about an hour to do all those stitches. FYI, so you understand the time that's, you know, passed. Okay, so now we have these two pieces. So I think I will call this a video. I am going to stitch around both of these and obviously back them. So the way, or that one's already backed, but the way that I'm going to back this is actually quite easy. I'm literally just going to take a glue stick and then I'm going to um, go right over everything all of the stitches, all of the tape, and I'm going to put um, some packaging paper on it, and then I'm going to stitch around the very edge of it on my sewing machine, and that's gonna just trap everything so that nothing undoes. I don't think anything would undo anyways, um, because of that, um, whatchamacallit, the tape. So, oops, let's move that. Let me just show you. paper that I'm going to use is just paper bag. So we'll plunk that down on the paper bag and just kind of give it a little press. And then we'll cut it out. Okay, and let me just stitch it and I'll come back. All right, so there we go. They're both done and I'm really happy with both of them. I think that they're both really interesting and fun for different reasons. I love how the irises came out and I like that this is like kind of glitzy in the, in the light, but that you can still see all the details. Um, and yeah, this one's just fun and it's the kind of thing that like, it's got that extra kind of sensory texture to it in a journal. And so see, backed, backed, all good. Okay, well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do. I do try to do different kinds of tutorials and weird projects that I'm working on. Um, and yeah, we will talk again very soon. Bye for now.